sight of land. So we were a little apprehensive, but uh, as you can see, it's pretty comfortable down below, even though she is pretty small. We have these canvas lee boards that you tie up um, at night. Uh, that's because being a small ship, she does roll around quite a bit, and it keeps you from rolling out. It does. Uh, yeah, you might shut that off. Well, after a few days, uh, we got heading south, uh, as they say, to get to um, St. Thomas from from the northeast. You head south till the butter melts, and then turn uh, turn east. And we got into the trade winds, where I put my, put up my big trade trade wind sails. Keep going and uh, work out my navigation sights every day. Uh, with a sextant, and uh, everybody is usually amazed about navigation. It's a big mystery, I know. They always ask, well, how do you know which stars, you know, where, what, which star is which? Well, it's pretty easy because I use the, uh, the biggest star, which is the easiest one to find, and that's the sun. And uh, actually, it's quite a thrill when on the 12th day we saw St. Thomas on the horizon right when I thought it would be there because uh, up until then, I'd never taken a sight at sea in earnest, and in fact, for those 12 days, I didn't really know where we were, except uh, what, uh, what the mathematics had said and pointed to a point on the chart, but I had actually no way of knowing until we had seen St. Thomas arise out of, out of the uh, horizon. Coming into Charlotte Amalie, we uh, had met a lot of friends that we had seen previously on the inland waterway, spent a few days supplying up, having a steak dinner, etc., and then headed on out to some of the more quiet coves around. And uh, this was really relaxing. We could swim and for the first time have a kitty cook a meal without the boat rolling all over hell and uh, essentially gain back the weight we lost at sea because those first days at sea, um, to get our sea legs, we didn't really eat that much. Well, after about six weeks in the Caribbean, we decided instead of going down through the West Indies, we'd head on to Panama and go through the canal and out to the uh, West into the Pacific. So the first stop just, nor uh, just east of Panama Canal was the San Blas Islands in Panama. <clears throat> and it's a, these are a group of about 300 islands uh, that dot along the shoreline there. It's owned by the Kuna Indian Nation as a whole. And they take some, small, some of the small islands and make villages out of them. You can see they're packed just every square inch uh, with little houses and shacks and meeting halls. And it's like walking down alleyways uh, in between them. Then on the other islands, they have what they call plantation islands, which no one owns the land itself. But each family may own different coconut trees. And the families will come out, farm these plantation islands for a period of about three months, and then say the one guy will come back and his uncle will go out or his brother will go out and farm for another three months so that it's illegal to pick a coconut off the tree but you can pick it off the ground because if you're picking off the tree you're picking somebody else's coconut and when i say illegal actually it was just a custom because in the san blas it's one of the few civilizations or societies that we met that had uh, no such thing as crime they in fact they had no jails at all but the, uh, the interesting thing about the San Blas is that they were still very primitive, and the women wore these fancy uh, brocaded uh, or, or applique blouses. Now, this is their everyday dress. This is what they wore when um, uh, cooking, tending, sewing, uh, tending the fields, going up the river to wash their clothes, everything, with the gold earring in the nose and the beads around the, um, the wrists, et cetera. Well, from San Blas, we headed towards the Panama Canal, where uh, we followed this big freighter into the lock, into the first lock, tied up behind him with uh, lines from each of our quarters, uh, two lines off the bow, two off the stern, as uh, just right after this, the water starts boiling into this lock with such force that you have to keep the lines constantly taut. You'll be smashed against the, excuse me, against the side of the um, uh, lock. Anyway, it raised you up to a height of about 112 feet go through Gatun Lake and then down the other side on the outward locks. Again, a great feeling when this final lock opens up and right around the corner we know is the great Pacific Ocean. Fortunately, it was low tide and uh, there was about an 18 foot tide there at Panama City. Uh, but after spending 
uh, a week or so in uh, Panama City there and getting resupplied. Here we are taking on water for what we would consider uh, the longest. Well, here we go to the Galapagos and then through to the Marquesas. And, and we don't expect to be in another town after this for six months. Now, our water supply is about, uh, we carry 30 gallons of water and, uh, no, excuse me, 60 gallons of water and two 30 gallon tanks. We left from Panama heading towards the Perlis Islands in the Bay of Panama, which is about 60 miles away. And since there was no wind, we were powering along. All of a sudden, I looked down below in the cabin and it was just filled with water. I jumped down and tasted it. Oh, horrors, it was fresh water. At least we weren't sinking. But unfortunately, uh, a hose had come undone from the water tank. We lost all our fresh water. And the Perlis, we did not know whether we could get any water there or not. We didn't want to come all the way back to Panama City. So what we did is when we got there, we came to this little village and asked around if we could get any water. The guy said, oh yeah, sure, no problem. A couple of jerry cans loaded into an outboard and took us to this little island. Well, I was a little apprehensive, it didn't look too lush. But uh, after a half a mile walk up through the jungle, we came to what looked like a cement slab with some worms crawling along the top of it. And uh, the guy said, well, here we are. And as soon as he brushed away all the worms and stuff, uh, he started ladling out the water. Well, we didn't particularly want to, at that point, head back to Panama, so we took the water. Kitty spent three days boiling it uh, on the stove. I built a fire, made some charcoal, and filtered it through the charcoal, and then put a cap full of uh, Clor uh, Clorox into it, and it actually worked out pretty well. Well, from the Perlis Islands, now with our water tanks full and everything, we headed on out towards the Galapagos, crossing the equator. But it was so hot, and there's so light winds, that uh, it was pretty, it was very hot down below, and on deck it was even hotter. We rigged an awning, and uh, we were really pleased when out came the porpoise to escort us into the Galapagos. And you, you, actually, we saw a porpoise quite often. It was always a, a lot of fun to get up on the bow of the boat and see the porpoise come and play around with our bow wave. Anyway, once in the Galapagos, uh, we anchored in the little cove and went ashore to find a bunch of seals playing around. And because there were no um, men around, they have no fear of man. Uh, there is only one or two settlements on one of the on two of the islands in the Galapagos, and this one in Barrington, there was no man. Men very rarely came there, and so there was no fear. You could go right up to them, pet them, talk to them. But what was <laughs> trouble with it was is. That afternoon, we went diving for our dinner. Lo and behold, the uh, seals come in and start playing with you. And uh, I had a, uh, a shot on a nice grouper with just lined up. I was about to pull the, pull the trigger on the spear gun, and another uh, seal comes along, grabs my gun, and pulls it away. He's playing tug of war with me. Now, the, the, uh, the, one of the amazing things about the Galapagos is the, the vast difference between each of the islands, and they're relatively close to each other. Uh, but there are no, this is where Darwin uh, developed his theory of evolution, because there are no storms to blow animal life from one um, island to, to, the, to the next. And they're so, they're volcanic islands, they're so deep, the water between them, they've never been attached to each other. And in each island, uh, the animals have developed so that they conform to their environment, like the tortoise on one island, where the leaves were growing higher off the ground than the other had a, had a hump in the middle of their back and they had a very long neck to reach the leaves, whereas in other islands were more lush, they didn't develop this thing. Also, we like to play around with the uh, marine iguana and, uh, and the land iguanas. These guys grew to about a uh, size of about three, three and a half feet, and also were not afraid of you. In fact, they were quite aggressive. They'd come right up to you and, and uh, try to bite your hand or something. Again, another uh, bay that we were anchored next to uh, and with a bunch of flamingos used to fly in and feed, so not everything was ugly in the Galapagos. With also the little penguins. These were the shyest of the animals to uh, photograph. This is about as close as I could ever come to them. Well, after a few weeks in the Galapagos, we sat and had dinner with uh, another boat that night as the sun went down in uh, Sullivan Bay and talked about our next passage, which was 3,000 miles of open water to the Galapagos. And Roger and I decided we were gonna have a race. Well, as it turned out, uh, we left. A little louder? Okay. 
The, this 3,000 miles was probably the most perfect sailing you'll get anywhere in the world. It was trade winds the whole way for 22 days that it took us to make the passage. It blew between 18 and 22 knots. And here I've got my trade wind sails up as we're barreling along. Now people ask us, what do we do during the day? Well, there's things like uh, beautiful sunsets at night and uh, haircuts when my hair got a little bit too long and started getting in my eyes. Right? Uh, also, in nicer days, Kitty would make some bread. And again, without much water, and we didn't like to wash our clothes uh, too often, uh, consequently, we usually, uh, uh, occasionally, occasionally we'd catch a, uh, a dolphin fish, which is about the best eating, and it's not a uh, dolphin mammal that you know of, it's uh, called in Hawaii mahi-mahi or dorado. But anyway, again, back to the clothes, well, frequently we got along without wearing much at all. And again, there were some beautiful rainbows to be seen. As I say, 22 days, the most perfect sailing, brought us into at last the first of the South Sea Islands. Uh, this, in the Marquesas, was really Michener's paradise. This is the main street of town, one of the biggest towns in the, in the uh, Marquesas, Atuana. Uh, there's no problem with traffic jams. These are the only two cars in the whole island. And uh, we had came in, checked in with the French customs, and then sailed around to another smaller bay where this family, this Marcasian family, lived. Uh, they had the whole valley to themselves. They asked us if we'd like to take a walk up the valley and see uh, the um, waterfall. So we said, sure, we'd love to, because they said it wasn't too far away. Well, five miles later, we begin to see the outline of the waterfall. And as we get closer to it, we realize that it might be worthwhile. She then wound us down some paths through the jungle to the base of the waterfall there. That it fell, it hit, and then went into a, a cave where we all, uh, there was a group of us, at that time there was about three boats. We went up and took showers underneath the waterfall. The next day, Danielle took us out uh, pig hunting, and we got a, uh, about a 35-pound pig that he cooked in the ground that night, baked it in the ground, and had a big uh, a luau. Then from there, back on to uh, Nukahiva. Um, well, the slide that didn't drop in was the um, Maurice's uh, General Store, which is about as big as uh, the area that I'm standing in here. And this was Maurice, the uh, trader, who's half English and half Marcasian and Maurice's son. And he sold us the dry goods. And then we walked up the hill to another German farmer who sold us the uh, uh, fresh vegetables. Well, from here, we headed on to Tahiti and thinking that we could resupply, at least in Tahiti. But when we got there, it turned out to be fet. And for seven days, this was Bastille Day, and for seven days, they had festivals. The trouble with Tahiti was, we were a little disappointed with Tahiti because, of course, commercialism had gotten there. And, for example, during the FET, uh, in the past, this has been a, a, a time of uh, sporting events, and the big thing is the dance contest. The, uh, the Polynesians come from many, even thousands of miles away from all the islands and to compete in the, in the dance contest. The only thing is that now it has gotten uh, to be commercialized and expensive. They, they put a, a ring around the arena, and charge you to come in. They charge you five dollars to come in and ten dollars for a camera. So it's gotten so expensive that the Polynesians themselves can't watch the um, the uh, dance contest. And actually, neither could Kitty and I. We didn't want to pay that kind of money. So we headed from there on up to Bora Bora, where here we took the picture of the boat underneath the twin peaks of Bora Bora, and did some swimming and diving. And, and the water was so clear there that you can see a bottle cap at 60 feet. The water here now is about 40 feet. I came, came up with this octopus we had for dinner, which was fine until uh, someone turned the lights on and just as Kitty was stuffing a piece into her mouth and saw the sucker staring her in the face. And that was the end of that meal for her. In fact, she's never eaten octopus since. From Bora Bora, we went on to Tonga. And in Tonga, they were a little more primitive, uh, but still civilized. However, these guys came out and wanted to to trade shells with us, and we've woven baskets, etc. 
and the only payment that I could give at the time was uh, a Polaroid picture. Well, the guy was so pleased with his Polaroid picture that he invited us into his house that night for dinner. And when we got into the house, oh, wait a minute. We got into the house, we found uh, that uh, their style of serving you dinner consisted of Kitty and I sitting cross-legged on that. This is, their house is just uh, the four walls and mats on the floor. We sat cross-legged on one side of the, uh, of the room and they sat, 16 of them sat cross-legged on the other side and watched as we ate a chicken dinner uh, because it's not polite for the host to eat with the guests. Well, after dinner, I had been told that we would be invited to join in the kava ceremony. And the kava ceremony I had heard was where the women chew the kava root and spit their saliva into a bowl, which the men then drink. Well, not wanting to partake in that ceremony, I have been trying to think up an excuse, and finally I hit on it. I would tell them I was a Mormon, <laughs> because I'd seen a Mormon church in the little village on another island. So as we're sitting there, and they asked me, do I want to join in the Kabbalah ceremony? I said, uh, gee, I'd really like to, but you know, I'm a Mormon and I can't, uh, I can't um, drink uh, kava. And the guy next to me said, oh no, no problem, no worry, boss. He says, I'm a Mormon too, we can drink it. <laughs> so I couldn't get out of it. Luckily though, they don't chew it anymore. They just mash in the pedestal, or pestle. Well, from Tonga, we headed off into really rainy weather uh, towards Fiji. Now here Kitty is pretty happy even though it is miserable weather because her parents are coming down and we're going to see them for the first time in a year in Fiji. The only trouble was uh, the first time uh, her father got on board the boat after about 10 minutes he got seasick and decided to leave, had dinner that night with us, did manage the dinner, left and that was the last time he got on board the boat. Well right after her parents left we had warnings of a hurricane coming towards Fiji Luckily, there was a, we took the boat up this river behind Suva and into a little estuary with a couple of other cruising yachts, tied it off like uh, the lattice work, like a spider web, uh, to the mangroves, which are very spongy trees and bend rather than break, and then secured everything down solid. And that night, or that afternoon, the wind came up, and here it was blowing about 90 knots or 120 miles an hour. Uh, which doesn't seem too much to you with the tornadoes, but this had a circumference of about 400 miles. And after the hurricane was over, we made our way out to the harbor to see the damage that had been done. This was used to be Queen Salote's boat of uh, ex-Queen of Tonga that had uh, dragged and gone on the reef. Well, as soon as the weather cleared, we wanted to get out of uh, Fiji because it was the onrush, oncoming hurricane season and uh, would be hurricane season in this area of the world for the next six months. So we headed on down to New Zealand, where we went into uh, Auckland Harbor, our first real major city in nine months. And here we picked up mail and got all the news back home that Nixon was in trouble, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, after doing a, about three weeks worth of maintenance on the boat, normal maintenance, we decided we were going to see South Island. So we put on some packs. Kitty and I did, <clears throat> and hitchhiked 1,500 miles down to the tip of South Island. And New Zealand, the hitchhiking is so easy that uh, you don't even have to stick your thumb out. If you've got a pack on your back with an American flag on the, bottom, on the back of it, people will just normally stop and pick you up without you even asking. But not only do they pick you up and give you a ride, they insist that you stay at their house that night and give you dinner and send you off in the morning the next day. And we got down through the sheep country and went down to the uh, Milford Sound, the fjords of Milford Sound area down the bottom of South Island. And these mountains go from a height of 7,000 feet straight down into the water to 2,000 foot depth, uh, which was uh, New Zealand was the most impressive um, in terms of uh, natural beauty, any place that we had been to. But after our vacation was over, our um, savings account was a little depleted, so we decided we'd head on towards Sydney here we coming in with the Sydney Opera House in the background and work for a while. Kitty got a job as a secretary. I was lucky enough to get a job with uh, doing a special project for First National City Bank. And it would seem kind of funny <laughs> to have to get in a suit and tie every morning with my briefcase and go to work. 
well, three months of this, and, our, and uh, the special project was finished. Our bank account was fattened up again, and, so we, and the hurricane season up north was over. We headed back up the Barrier Reef, uh, coming into Yablanda River, just as the shrimp boats are going out at night, and uh, went into a pub to see a real fair dinkum Aussie. And that's a real true and dyed Aussie at his favorite place, the pub. Uh, I'm sure Steve and Mary Kay will appreciate these types. Then on other islands up in the Barrier Reef, again, we're fishing. And most of the time we're in small islands, or out of, um, not at sea, but you know, anchored in, in non-industrial areas. We lived off the land as much as possible. Here we just come back uh, with our dinner for the night while Kitty had been chipping oysters off the rocks for hors d'oeuvres. I think that's it. From, uh, from the Barrier Reef, which we were a little disappointed in because we had, we had heard so much about it uh, in the terms of diving, uh, and the reason we were disappointed was because that, uh, where we were, it was all uh, the water was real turbid from the water coming, uh, from the rivers coming out, and to get out to the reef was 40 miles away with no anchorage for the night, and we couldn't make it all the way out and back. So we decided to leave the barrier reef and head on up to New Guinea. And here we are in a samurai, the southern tip of New Guinea, where uh, we decided to take a walk up this trail we had seen see what the island was all about. We met these guys coming down the trail. Just as it started raining, he leans over, grabs a big elephant uh, leaf, cuts the thing off, and uses it as an umbrella. He also told us that a little further up the path would be a school, and we'd, we would like to go uh, see what, what kind of uh, teaching facilities they had in these out-of-the-way places. A little further up turned out to be about two miles, but these are the kids in the school. Now, this school, was really remarkable in the sense that kids come here from islands all around the area, little small islands, and they arrive at school in the end of January at seven years old with a sarong that they have wrapped around their waist, a bush knife, and a sleeping mat, and that's all I have. Now they are completely independent. They have to build their own uh, living quarters, their own cooking quarters, plant their own food, harvest their own food, cook their own food, plus study their lessons from age seven. They don't see their parents normally until December, except uh, once in a while the local mothers uh, that are nearby come in for a PTA meeting, which we had seen later. Now here they are building their cooking, sh uh, cooking shack, and for the twine they use to, to uh, tie these bamboo slats up, there's another guy pulling the uh, bark off of a branch. Now they learn this from each other and from their fathers back in the main villages. But as I said, it just happened to be Parent Teacher's Day at school, and these are the parents coming in their great Sunday best. It turns out that uh, these are fresh-made uh, grass skirts, and the one on the right, she's very wealthy because hers has got some red uh, dye in the skirt, and this was a really a fancy, now she was really decked down. And on in, in another bay, this is Kanakapi Bay, which was uh, a big PT base during the Second World War. And some of you may know it. This was the site of McHale, uh, was it McHale's Navy took place supposedly in this bay. And we just come into anchor here. And again, all of a sudden, our boats are swarmed by natives and the canoes coming to see who we are and what we're about and to trade shells with us. And even this little tyke. I would gather he's about three years old, rode this canoe by himself three quarters of a mile across the bay to trade that little shell with us for a tin of bully beef. So the, the kids in, uh, in the New Guinea area were quite independent at a very young age. On Port and these, oh, they always, and the kids also always wanted to have their pictures taken. They just, they were, they were kind of shy but really happy kids most of the time. And then we came into the uh, into Port Moresby, the main town in New Guinea, went to the marketplace, where you see a uh, conglomeration of Papuans, which are the southern people in New Guinea, and the New Guineans from the highlands. Now these are, the, this guy's Papuan, and so she, she's selling betel nut, which is uh, what they chew and makes their teeth turn white. 
and gives them a narcotic effect. Uh, it also kills their appetite, but it also it ruins their teeth as well. Now this, this guy here, he's sitting there inside the fence chewing his beetle nut, spending most of the day doing that. And, now this woman here is a New Guinean from the Highlands. And up there, uh, the women consider it very attractive to tattoo their faces. I, I don't know if you can see it too well, but she's got her face, all of them have their faces completely tattooed. Well, from New Guinea, we set sail and headed out through the Torres Straits, where, uh, to give you an example of the sometimes exacting nature of the navigation, after 280 miles, we had to pick up Bramble Key, which is that little thing off to the right-hand side of the, uh, of the uh, horizon there. We're now about three miles from it. If you miss this light, you hit, you'll, there's reefs to the left and a fly river entrance to the right where 40 miles from land, it's three feet deep, the ocean, so you'll just run aground and, and uh, be shipwrecked. As a matter of fact, the one yacht that left the week before we did didn't have a clear sky uh, the day he was making his landfall on Bramble Key, couldn't get a fix, and uh, was actually 30 miles south of where he thought he was and hit the reef and almost lost his ship and his life. The thing that uh, helps the or hinders your navigation there is not only the fact that he couldn't get a fix, but the fly, the, there's unknown, strong and unknown currents in the area. One day it'll be pushy 30 miles to the north, and the next, if it's been raining hard up in the New Guinean highlands, the, the old fly river will be exceptionally uh, heavy and influence the current and push you 30 miles south. But anyway, once inside the Torrey Straits, we anchored for the night and went uh, diving, and in 20 minutes came back with a couple of nice lobster that fed seven people for dinner. There was another yacht that had sailed in here with us. Well, picking up our anchor in the Torrey Straits and going on through the Indian Ocean, into the Indian Ocean. After 12 days, dawn rose one morning and Bali uh, is in the, on the horizon. We came into Bali and anchored, went into Denpasar, the big town in, in Bali. Now this was probably the most unique uh, place we've been in terms of different type of s civilization. Uh, it had some Asian influence, but what was most remarkable about, about it was the, the uh, amount of culture that the island had. Everybody on the island, aside from doing their main job, uh, whether it be in the town or, or tilling the rice paddies, took up another hobby such as uh, sculpting, painting, wood carving, dancing, and uh, the amount of culture, as I say, was just abundant in the, in the islands. Well, in town, Here's Kitty, we went in the market uh, dickering for some Brussels sprouts, fresh greens. But once inside, the, the costumes, again, were superb. Now this is uh, evil in his eternal struggle with, uh, with good, and good never quite, he, he wins over, but evil is reborn again, so that both, both good and evil turn out to be immortal. This is Ro Rwanda, the, the good dragon. Now the Balinese kids, every time we drove down the street, they would say, hello, hello, and they wanted us to take their picture again. Now these, they were much more outgoing and happy than the New Guinean people. Even the older guys wanted their picture taken. <laughs> And this, he was the high priest of one of the uh, most sacred temples on the island. But he was duly impressed. He was as impressed with me as I was with him. Well, from Bali, we headed out into the Indian Ocean, uh, about a thousand miles away, to hit on Cocos Keeling, which just is a little atoll in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And even in Cocos Keeling, we had to go through customs and put up with the paperwork as the Australians come out and, and process us in. And at Cocos Keeling, uh, there was about six or seven boats that all came in and anchored there for a week or so doing last minute maintenance and repair before we headed out for a 2,500 mile trip to Mauritius. 
And all of us were a bit nervous because the Indian Ocean was considered to be the worst ocean in the world. So after doing our maintenance repair, we had uh, diving, coming up with some fish for a fish. We had a, everybody got a couple of fish that night. We brought it ashore and had a great fish fry the night before we left, which lasted till well into the night. And uh, consequently, see, none of us have alarm clocks on the boat. We don't have to get up at a certain time. And it wasn't until mid-afternoon that we hanked on our storm sails and headed out into the Indian Ocean. Now this is, uh, the, on the right we have a storm jib pulled out, on the left I got a little storm trisail. That's about 70 square feet of sail. My normal complement of sailing, working sail, is 500 square feet. So I was going with uh, just a little over a tenth of the sail area. I also did the first three days 155 miles a day, which was the highest average I'd had on the whole trip. It didn't blow less than 35 knots. And actually, for the 17 days that it took us to get to Mauritius, it blew between 35 and 55 for 14 of those 17 days. This was what it looked like most of the time. And uh, as you can see, we didn't go out on deck too often because every time I went out, I'd get pasted with water. But 17 days later, we came to Mauritius, and here, uh, again, all the six or seven boats grouped together and spent a couple days, a couple of weeks relaxing before heading down around Madagascar to uh, South Africa. Now, uh, Kitty had made friends with a guy that had owned a racehorse, and she got to exercise him every morning on the beach. Well, when we headed out for the 1,300-mile trip to Durban, there was about five boats leaving at the same time. And usually you'll go to sea. That night you'll see their masthead light dip down over the horizon. That's the last you'll see of them until you get to the next port. But this time was really unique. For after six days, we Skylark, uh, another boat, came across us and uh, said, let's drink a toast to Mauritius. Well, we didn't have any beer on board. And what we did is we sailed up in front of them, dropped the line over our stern with a string bag tied to it, pulled in front of them, they pulled the bag up, filled it full of beer, we pulled away, pulled the beer in and drank a toast. And then split on as he pulled away from us the rest of the day. Again, five days later, lo and behold, I was taking my noon shot and uh, there was a little wave on the horizon that didn't seem to be going away. As we come on closer, it turned out to be uh, another friends of ours that had left the same time we did. And the night before had been 20 miles away from us because we had we maintain a radio contact once a day, give our noon positions out. And we sailed along like this. Now he's under his steering gear. See that uh, that wind vane on the back of his boat? That steers the boat relative to the wind. And I have one on the back of mine, which is the yellow uh, blade. And uh, we were just both the same speed. We sailed like this for a whole day, just sitting there gabbing and telling stories that we hadn't because we hadn't seen any of uh, them for, I guess now it was about 10 days. And that night we pulled apart and figured that was the last we'd see of them. Well, at night it started, especially because it started getting uh, rainy and miserable weather. But lo and behold, the next morning, there's Roger and Sheila right behind us again. But as you can tell, the weather changed drastically. Um, we, again, we, we, right after this picture, we went down below for our morning radio schedule, speaking of the other three boats. And Skylark, who is now 75 miles ahead of us, said that he was hove to and had been hove to for three hours in 50 knots of wind. Hove to means back winding a small jib and just sitting there riding it out because it's blowing too hard to sail. Uh, just that then I stuck my head out the hatch, saw this line squall coming at us. We got all our sails down just as it hit, bang. And here's Roger with his sails down. Right here it's blowing 50 knots, which is about 65 miles an hour. And it flattened the seas out because there was a swell coming from the opposite direction that had just flattened out. Ten minutes afterwards, this is what it looked like. And about 15 minutes after this, this the seas had built up to be pretty strong. This lasted uh, a couple of days uh, before, we got in, before we got into Durban. But all of us made it into Durban, which I was amazed was a little bit bigger of a city than I had thought it would be. It was about a million people and uh, we anchored right at the Durban skyline. After doing again, every time we get into port, we spend a couple of days or a couple of weeks doing maintenance and repair. And uh, after that, we got together with a couple of friends, 
and took a Land Rover up through the um, uh, native reserves and the game reserves, where it's an area about the size of uh, the state of Rhode Island, say. And just driving along the street, you see um, all the animals that you see there were in were incredibly beautiful condition. Their coats were just glossy, and uh, they weren't any of the skinny type animals you see in the zoo. The zebra and uh, and Paula. And the highlight of the trip was coming around a corner face to face with a giraffe. From there we went uh, coming out of the reserve, the African kids. Again, a little sh definitely shyer than Bali and also shyer than um, than the New Guinean kids. They just didn't quite know what to make of you. Well, from Durban, we, we rounded the Cape, the Cape of Storms. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the gale that we were in going around the Cape. But uh, the seas, now I won't exaggerate, but the seas were about 30 feet. It was blowing 50 to 55 knots from behind us. We were running with it. And uh, we, Kitty and I, had taken on a crew member for that trip because of the high steamer traffic involved. And uh, when it got dawn and he could see the height of the waves, he got, was so scared that he got sick. Just as he got sick, we, I was out on deck with him. We heard this roar like a freight train. And there was a wave about 300 yards behind us that was easily 60 feet tall. And the last 20 feet were breaking in a huge cascade of water. And if that had hit us, I wouldn't be giving the lecture today. <laughs> but we did. We made it to Cape Town with no problem, where we reprovisioned and headed on out into the Atlantic for our final leg home. Uh, after 13 days, we made St. Helena, which was kind of a desolate looking island from the, from the sea. And I can see why Napoleon was pretty discouraged upon arriving here. But once he went inland and saw his house, where he spent the last seven years of his life, it wasn't too bad after all. Uh, the inland was pretty lush. From St. Helena, we headed uh, 31 days at sea to the Caribbean. Uh, with only a four-hour stop at one small island to get some vegetables. Uh, anyway, up through the Grenada Grenadines, St. Lucia, and into Martinique, and here uh, from the main part of town, you see this the, the dominating cathedral of Martinique uh, looking out over from the top of the mountain. Well, after we kind of rushed through the Caribbean because, we, again, the hurricane season was coming on us, and we were kind of near home. We wanted to get home, and we thought, Boy, after 32,000 miles, this last leg is going to be a piece of cake. And initially, it started out pretty good, except that the wind was pretty light. And here, it, uh, in fact, went dead calm after about four days. So I decided, I took a swim out off the boat and took a picture of the ocean heaving and sighing as we were just calling and wallowing around. It wasn't so bad, though, because it did give me an opportunity to take a shower. Uh, as it wasn't uh, really rough, and this is our local, our running water on the Binka. But also the calm water was uh, very disturbing because every time it went calm, anywhere in the ocean, and I'm talking about any ocean in the world, you could see the pollution, man's rape of his environment, the oil slicks. We saw it here in the Atlantic, we saw it in the Indian Ocean, and we saw it in the Pacific. And uh, Thor Heyerdahl and Jacques Cousteau, who are decrying the, the rape of the, uh, the oceans, are not exaggerating. It is everywhere. Well, a few days later, of still light winds, I began to feel like I was sitting on some type of a time bomb because I knew the hurricane season we were, was, already into, was already upon us. We were still in the hurricane belt. And I got an uneasy feeling as there was no winds. We were just kind of wallowing. We'd used up all our fuel. We just had to wait it out. And uh, one day we were down below, and I just poked my head out to see a water spout coming right at us. Now, this is similar to a tornado, except that it's sucking the water up uh, at sea. I saw this. I turned the engine on quickly, flipped the boat around, and just got out of its way as it passed about 100 feet from us. And you could just feel the, the wind starting to pull you into it. The base of that water spout, it, right here it's about 100 yards away, 300 feet. 
the base of that water spout is about 30, 35 feet, so that it was strong enough that it would have just ripped our sails to shreds. But pretty soon the wind started picking up, and we put up our sail and heading, heading on out. However, a few hours after I thought we were going to have good winds, the sea started building up even further. The winds continued to increase, so I took our sails down, put up the storm jibs, and when it was blowing 70 knots, I took the storm jibs down and decided to wait it out. As you're sitting there with no sail on, just, as they say, lie in a hull, just the boat by itself, uh, it was now at about 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, and Kitty and I were down below, the, as we did with the expression, batten down the hatches. We had all our hatches secured and fastened so that if a wave, you know, if we got washed over, uh, we wouldn't sink. And uh, sat down below while the ship was kind of bobbing there. And I say that uh, the safest thing in the sea in a storm is a light bulb. And that's exactly the way we were then, is a light bulb just kind of bouncing around. It's a little bit uncomfortable. But because of the 5,000 pounds of lead in the keel, uh, we remained upright, <clears throat> at least for part of the time. About 1 o'clock, as we rolled over, you normally would roll and roll back again. We rolled up, and it didn't come back. And then crash. Uh, we were, at that time, Kitty and I were sitting on the bulkhead, or I mean the overhead, on the roof of the, um, of the cabin, while a wall of water was coming down below at us. But my only thought was, when are we going to write? When are we going to write? When we finally did write, uh, I jumped down. We had three feet of water down below. We were in the process. We were, you know, on the verge of foundering. I stuck my head out the hatch to see. This is what I saw in the morning. Uh, this, this is what it looked like the next morning. Uh, that's how our cabin had gotten everything thrown around. Uh, just everything came out of everywhere. And the most dangerous thing I'm convinced now was not the fact that we would might have sunk, but we could have gotten killed by flying objects. As uh, people we know around the year before us that had come around Madagascar, same thing happened to them, and one of their crew was killed by a, uh, a heavy weight that hit him in the head. Uh, anyway, out on deck, uh, now at, at, picture yourself now at uh, one o'clock in the morning, it's pitch black, the wind is screaming through the rigging, absolutely just screaming. It's blowing so hard that we're over so much, you know, it's blowing the mass over where the water is up to the windows. I'm standing on the sides, not on the floor. And uh, it took me, uh, well, the hatch had blown away. You can see the rail there in the front where it's blown away. And that white thing covering it is just a piece of plywood that I had. It took me two and a half hours to get some nails, drill some holes, and nail that plywood hatch back on over the covering so if another wave came it wouldn't uh, sink us while we were, Kitty was standing down below uh, bailing like mad, working and manning the pumps. To give you an idea of the force of the wave, you can see on the left side of that hatch there are some stubs sticking up off the um, uh, deck. That used to be grab rails, mahogany grab rails, though was an inch and a half thick by two inches the base, bolted through bolted, and uh, it had just the wave had just broken that off. It had taken our yellow wind vane off the back. It had bent the stanchions in. It had, uh, uh, the, after I got the hatch nailed on, the sails had come on, one had come on loose, and it took me 20 minutes to grab uh, a sail that would be maybe five square feet of sail. It was flogging so much, but it was blowing so hard that I couldn't grab it in until I finally got a line around it and, and slowly cinched it in. Uh, the next morning, most of our sails were, or a lot of our sails were in rags. So even though we were, this, this took place 500 miles from home, and uh, even though we were uh, only 500 miles, it took us another eight days to get home from here. But with relief and a sigh, we doused our sails for the last time as we came into New York Harbor with uh, New York in the background. And that was the end of two years, nine months, and 28 days. Let's see. That's it.